Hello, my prolific art sluts. It's Alison Moon, and you're listening to the Artgasm Podcast. On today's podcast, I interview artist, photographer, Substantia Jones, the creator of the Add a Positivity Project, a project that seeks to normalize and exalt depictions of nude, fat people. And it's a really great conversation. It begins a little bit oddly in which we're kind of trying to figure out if we've, if we've met in real life, because a lot of the uh, episode interviews that you may have noticed are with people that I enc- encounter in my life, friends who are working in the art and sex industry and Substantia and I have similar people in common and we realized that we actually met at a friend's wedding our friend Melina Williams who is also a very uh, regular model for Substantia's work so it starts a little bit oddly but we get into the meat of her work quite quickly so uh, I hope that you enjoy the little detour into the (laughs) personal interactions therein. But before we get to that, um, I don't have a whole lot of by way of announcements. One thing that I did want to encourage you to consider, though, is that I'm always looking for new interview subjects, particularly people who do really interesting work in maybe genres that you haven't heard yet on the podcast. And I'm always looking for more people of color to interview. So if you know people who fit the bill, please reach out and let me know. You can tell me via email at artgasmcast at gmail.com, or you can just find me on social media. I'm on Instagram at Allison underscore moon. That's A-L-L-I-S-O-N underscore moon. You can also find me on Twitter at Hey Alley Moon. That's H-E-Y-A-L-L-I-E-M-O-O-N. And always feel free, even if you don't know these people in real life, to just tag somebody that I should consider their work. Obviously, Instagram is a great tool for this, although it can be a little bit dicey with sex positive work because Instagram, like all social media, is kind of notoriously sex phobic. So a lot of my the people who I love the most have a limited ability to post their art on Instagram. And at the same time, it's been a wonderful resource for me to find other artists. And because of this brave new world where everybody's mostly at home, I've been able to do more and more interviews online, on distance. And so it doesn't matter where in the world they are, we can connect. So if you know somebody... I mean, I love the idea of interviewing more people who are not from North America. If you uh, know somebody who I should reach out to, just let them let me know who they are and I'll research their stuff. So that's the little bit of announcement. One other small bit of news is that, of course, I've been working on a number of different projects during this sequestering, quarantining, social distancing era. And one of them is that I narrated the best bondage erotica of the year, edited by Rachel Kramer Bussell. And it's on Audible right now, and I really enjoyed the book. It's six and a half hours of hot scenes of various kinds of bondage. And so if you like the sound of my voice, and if you enjoy bondage stories, I recommend going to check it out. It's on audible.com, and if you look for best bondage erotica of the year, or if you Google my name, Allison Moon, you will find it. And um, I encourage you, if you're already an Audible subscriber, to go ahead and give it a listen. I think it's pretty fun. It's pretty hot. I definitely had to take breaks in uh, narrating it, if you know what I mean. So I recommend checking it out. All right, with all of those little bits of items out of the way, allow me to introduce you to my guest, Substantia Jones. Substantia, thank you so much for joining me. I'm delighted to talk to you. I've been a fan of your work for a number of years now, and um, I just... It's exciting to me to discuss your work. <laughs> so pleased to be here. Thanks for asking me, Allison. Yay, my pleasure. I don't know. I don't live in New York, but I spend a lot of time in New York. And I, I a lot of my friends have been subjects of yours. So it's oh, entirely possible at a party yeah. somewhere in some state of undress. You, I think you were at a, a wedding uh, in which I held the hookah. Oh my gosh! Yes, then well, I, then I I'm, I believe I did meet you, or at least, <laughs> or at least celebrated under the chuppah with you. Wasn't that a great wedding? This oh is a horrible, horrible thing to say in a podcast and be so coy, but it was. So well, I don't wonderful. think that they, they would be insecure about me us mentioning who it was. So. I don't think yeah, so. Either. Go for it. Yeah, so Melina Williams, and when she married her beloved Hermeister, um, and it was a it was a beautiful wedding. It was so like. It was so calm and beautiful and like it just was that kind of like when you get to have emergence of different communities and you're like, yes, we understand why this marriage is happening and we understand like that this is like families coming together. It was beautiful. Exactly. And I they had me photograph their collaring ceremony, which was um, sometime earlier, sometime before the wedding. I don't know how how much longer. And. It was so tender and wonderful. Mm. And it was at that moment, I got it. 
I mm-hmm. thought, oh, I've never seen such visible love between two mm-hmm. people. I get it. I uh, okay. I am now fully supportive of this this union. But the the two things that got me at the wedding, one was anyone who knows Molina knows she's um, she is very into service. That is her mm-hmm. kink. And so in a wedding, the bride is the, you know, the, is the focus. And it can be not that she's uncomfortable being the focus, but mm-hmm. she, when she came through the synagogue doors in the back to come up the aisle in her gorgeous dress, she had an arm full of loose flowers. I'm going to cry right now. And she, <laughs> she stopped to hand each attendee a flower. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that is perfect. I was sitting next to her mom at that point, And I was, I just thought that is so Molina. That is such perfection. And then mm-hmm. the other moment was some, at some point mm-hmm. during the ceremony or immediately following, um, the uh the rabbi asked if anyone wanted to say anything and they passed around the mic Mm -hmm. and a little girl do you remember this a little girl in the audience said i wish something like i'm gonna have to paraphrase sorry little girl Mm -hmm. (laughs) she said i i wish you love or i hope you'll be together for uh, until you're ready not to be together anymore something mm-hmm. like that it was mm-hmm. so it was bo- both sweet and very uh, grown up and yeah, very um, wise yeah i was i was touched by all of it it was just a fabulous wedding yeah it was lovely it was lovely and then the the classic cab that they had that they drove away in the the picture cab that was that was one of my favorite parts too <laughs> There's so much I don't remember. I remember photos from inside the cab. Uh, yeah, yeah. That I, was great. I remember something significant about it. But yeah, that was that was wild. Yay. Um, and I I sat across at the reception. I sat across from one of their neighbors. Mm. And I don't think she knew what she was in for because these are, <laughs> these are openly kinky people and Mm -hmm. kink was a very significant part of their wedding ceremony Mm -hmm. um and i don't think this neighbor had any idea what she was in for and she said so you know kind of left. (laughs) i guess i was kind of a straight looking person and she thought i'm gonna i'm gonna you know pick this woman's brain and see what's up she said Mm -hmm. i had no idea they've been in my home and i had no Mm -hmm. idea um, and I just, yeah. I thought it was adorable. It was good. Yeah. Because, and also like integrating kink into a ceremony like that, it wasn't, it didn't feel like, you know, I think a lot of, you know, vanilla listeners might think, oh my gosh, like, you know, whips and chains. And it's like, no, it was really talking about service and it was talking about like what it feels like to be owned by somebody who loves and respects you. And, and then there, there was the integration of Judaism and the integration of African traditions and the, I mean, it was just in African-American and traditions. languages and it was, yeah. it was, love was apparent and it was very sweet and wonderful. And then there were, um, you know, the, the chamber orchestra with some of the pieces that Georg had written for the wedding. Yes. Oh my gosh. It yeah, was, that was like an exclusive concert with one of the world's most incredible com- composers it right was. there with like, you know, sharing that space with like 80 other people it was great. And their <laughs> music is decidedly unwedding like. So I thought, hmm, what's this going to be like? And it was just perfect. The whole thing yeah. was perfection. It was them. Oh, I want to go again. I know, I know. Okay, <laughs> let's stop talking about other people and let's talk about you, Substantia. Okay, <laughs> okay let's. So tell me about the Adipositivity Positivity Project and what, you know, the inspiration was behind it. Uh, well, Adipositivity, the word is a portmanteau of the words adipose, meaning uh, fat tissue, and, um, and uh, positivity, meaning, you know, yay. <laughs> uh, and I, I got... Uh, and I've already forgotten what you asked. How I, how I came to came up with the idea was I I had observed um, a number of things in my uh, you know 100 years of life. I observed that <laughs> fat people. I'm a fat person. Fat people don't get positive or neutral visibility in our culture. We are um, 
fetishized uh, sometimes against our will, sometimes, you know, so we're okay with it. Uh, we are the butt of jokes. We are ridiculed. We are expected to be always uh, apologists or trying to do something about the weight. We, we will be accepted in society if we are um, unhappy with who we are. And wow, mm. what a horrible spot to be in. So I wanted to help provide, and I, and the purpose of visibility is without seeing ourselves represented in our culture, um, you know, you can't, you can't really thrive. You have to see yourself represented, um, not, not just coming up, but adults as well. We have to see ourselves represented and treated well. So none of this was happening. I, um, I saw in my own personal life how positive representation, regular bombardment of, you know, fat beauty, fat uh, people being okay with themselves, whether it involves beauty or not, is causes people to soften uh, when thinking of fat people, causes people to pay attention to us, to give us the gravitas that we need as a foundation to then go on and speak our minds and do our jobs and be happy and find love and have good sex and all of that. So I thought, well, I, I will. It works for me. I've seen it work for other people in my life. I'm going to bombard people with positive photos of fat people happily, comfortably displaying their bodies, often naked. Mm -hmm. um, because when do we see fat people naked unless it's, um, you know, in uh, glisteny porn or, you know, the butt of jokes. So mm -hmm. I started doing that in 07, uh, just a little photo blog. Um, I was my first model and then about a half dozen others came along with some coaxing, of course, and I didn't really know how to promote it and I didn't have in mind promoting it, so I didn't. And within a few months, it got noticed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it got noticed in by uh, bloggers first and then the press. And ever since then, I've, uh, it's all I can do to keep up with shooting people who contact me wanting to be photographed for the project. Oh, that's terrific. I do wow. sometimes ask, it, you know, if I see some like really good ink that I've just got to, you know, photograph, <laughs> but usually uh, I'm, I am asked and I, everybody, there's no process or selection. If you're fat and you and I can get in the same room with my camera, you're in. Mm. So tell me about the experience of working with models who, you know, are different ranges of professional, right? Like some of these people I know are professional naked people, and then some of them are very much not. So how do you either establish a set that feels safe for them to feel like embodied, or do you just kind of go with the flow? How does that look? It's, you know, it's funny it's actually easier to work with people who are not models and that's most of them there are a few i've i've photographed models i've photographed um people who work in the porn industry and when i when i photograph uh you know my my smut friends i have to use words like casual let's be more casual you know because they're they know how to um, how to situate their body in a, in, you know, a way that they feel it displays them in an optimal, optimal way. And I don't want that. And I don't mm -hmm. want anything overtly sexual. I never, I never want people, you know, licking their lips or giving a come hither look to the camera or, you know, arching their back or spreading their legs. Mm -hmm. Um, I like casual nudity. I love casual nudity. So mm -hmm. that's what I go for. I want, um, uh, and you know, if you're, if you're in on a shoot, you'll see it's not at all casual. Sometimes I spend 15 minutes posing a finger, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, we, we hold a lot of 
it's very difficult to um to get fingers to relax if you're not mm-hmm. relaxed so um i try to start from the ground up and uh have some laughs and maybe some music in certain situations maybe some wine that doesn't happen nearly often enough <laughs> um but it, it you know there's no one there's it's, it's not a cookie cutter thing some people uh, answer the door already buck naked and they're <laughs> completely comfortable. Uh, some people are so nervous. I I once photographed a couple, the uh, one of whom was uncomfortable undressing in front of the cat. Oh, so wow. I thought, oh, this is this is going to be interesting. Right. But by the end of the day, he was he was still naked when I left. I think Aww. when I shoot couples, I know they they boink after I leave <laughs> um, because a lot of them. This is the first time they've been naked together in front of someone else Mm. uh, or especially naked together in front of a stranger and they're Mm. taking pictures and they're going to be on the internet forever it's a big it's a big thing and um uh I make sure everybody knows how big a thing it is beforehand I don't I I don't uh, if you've, if anyone who's contacted me about a shoot knows, I send them this long ass list of notes, all there for a reason, because I want to warn people. I've been accused of scaring people off. I once collaborated with someone. Um, I don't like to collaborate, sorry, but I once mm-hmm. collaborated with someone. And when they saw that list that I send to models to let them know what to expect before, during, and after the shoot, they said, I don't want you sending this to our models. They're going to scare them off. Are you trying to scare them off? And yes, I am kind of trying to scare them off because this is a big decision. I, um, I, I have, and the models need to make some decisions on their own. And some of them, they put off until I say, how nude you get, you can decide when you, when we get there, when you meet me, because Mm. you might find me creepy and not want to take your clothes off. And I want to give you the option. Um, but some people really don't, especially young people, I don't think they think it through enough. So mm. I have to be mama bear and say, okay, this is the worst that can happen. This is the bad stuff that has happened to mm. people who've modeled for the Adipositivity Project. Some some adiposers have had their, um, their jobs threatened, their mm. child custody threatened. Mm. Um, they've been harassed. But, you know, there's also been good things. There was, there's um, a married couple out there because of the Adipositivity Project. Mm. One partner uh, was advertising, um, ah, maybe we shouldn't call it advertising, was, was listing a profile on a dating site and included her naked in the park in the snow photo. Oh my. And when, uh, uh, the her partner saw it they thought wow she must be cool to do that so (laughs) they got together and got married and I've since photographed the two of them together as well that's sweet yeah I like the um I think it's the the valentine series is that the one with yes yeah I I, yeah go ahead it's very it's a very happy thing and it's and you know sex definitely creeps into the valentine series a bit more than it does um, during the normal year because we have uh, couples interacting together. And a lot of that uh, is, you know, a lot of what you see is their idea. I had probably the most sexual, well, we've got one that's like full on appears to be cunnilingus happening um with laughter which is the best kind of cunnilingus Mm -hmm. but we also had one where the couple they were so sweet they they came a great distance for this shoot and they were uh they were nervous they they said they were fangirling and it was it was so sweet and they said okay here's here's something we do at home we want to do and it was kind of like a backwards crab position Mm -hmm. where 
he is um he is on his hands and feet uh, inverted with his belly up and she's on top of him with all her weight mm. and I got so much mail about that photo um and I was you know I really wasn't sure about it but uh, the mail was <laughs> everyone wanted to know were they really having sex mm. and I said you know my head was two feet from it and I can't <laughs> tell you I do not know I don't think so but you know it sure looks like it mm -hmm. um, but either way it was very impressive that he could do that I've heard from people who've tried it since no oh, I like the idea of people getting ideas yes but with varying degrees of success <laughs> and failure sometimes yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the, one of the th things that I find really sweet about the the Valentine series is it's a it's a range of different kinds of couples. Obviously, like you know, you've got trans couples and you've got interracial couples and you've got um, you know queer couples and straight couples. Um, but I think also there's a really beautiful thing you see some of the couples are you know one of the partners slim and one of the partners is fat. And I think that that's something you so rarely see unless it's again like high fetish kind of stuff where it's like a, a skinny meat guy being completely crushed by a woman but in these there's it's these are couples they're in love and at the same time you get to see the contrasts of their bodies you get to see the way their bodies interact in a way that is again like really wholesome even if it is sexual at the same time which is something i i find so rare in nude shoots or in, in just in, kind of even in, in just social acceptability of the idea of a slim person with a fat person unless it is a fetish that, and that, that is the reality though i, I mean mm -hmm. as a fat person i can tell you um i'm now like thinking back to all my partners and mm -hmm. i think most of them have been thin but mm -hmm. uh uh um, mainstream uh, um, press people ask me this with uh, great curiosity. And I tell them, mm. if you think about all the things we look for in a partner, we want, uh, I mean, and it's different for everybody. I, I look for someone who uh, enjoys humor, values humor, can make me laugh and wants to be made to laugh. I look for someone who is, has an abundance of kindness and is smart and cares deeply about social justice. Um, and the, and then there are, is the chemistry, but I don't look for someone whose weight matches mine. That would mm -hmm. never occur to me. That's, that's criteria for a seesaw partner, not for love. <laughs> I mean, love is completely different from, you know, playground stuff. I mean, not always, but mm. yeah. So yes, I, I think uh, uh, most of the fat people I know who are partnered, I mean, there's probably just as many who are partnered with thin people as mm. with fat people. But I know a mm. lot of fat people. I mean, you know, I've seen more naked fat people than a Lane Bryant dressing room. <laughs> no, my experience is going to be different from a lot of people's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too. And, and this isn't just the Valentine series, but a lot of your work is that I see an interesting balance between the kind of up close, like really kind of showing the textures of the flesh and the interactions of bodies, as well as you kind of zoom out a little bit and get a wider frame where you see the faces and you see the personalities and sometimes you'll see props or, or set pieces. And I'm wondering like your experience as a photographer of making that balance between like, this is just the aesthetic of like a black and white of texture. And this is something where I really want the personalities of these people to shine through. You will not want to hear the answer to that. <laughs> it's not very uh, romantic. It's not always artistic. Sometimes it's, hey, you can't show my face or I'll lose my job. Mm. So, okay, bodyscape time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, I'm gonna, you know, shoot uh, just your body. And, um, and also some of it, some of it, is and definitely was artistic choice in the beginning i had a very clear vision that i did not want faces because mm -hmm. a i i like the idea of bodyscapes i like the idea of uh partial 
views of a body like and not just in bodies not just in nude photography but in art i always wanted to focus on one painting of a triptych rather than the whole thing hmm. so that was what i went into this with but i found that it it didn't always work so well so i i sort of moved away from it but if you look at the older stuff um, which I'm not always happy about looking at because, uh, you know, there's been growth and change, but, you know, sure. think of the alternative. If, if the older stuff was the same as the newer stuff, that wouldn't be good either. But mm -hmm. a lot of people in the beginning, not only did I want that, and I didn't want the model looking back at the viewer. You know, I had a very specific thing in mind that I wanted to happen uh, in the viewer's head. And I didn't want the model looking at them, making them uncomfortable. I wanted them to feel freedom that they'd not felt before to actually look at fat bodies um, in, an, in an unvarnished way. Uh, but also back in those days, there were a lot more models who needed anonymity or mm. wanted anonymity. And that's less the case now. So I have more people who want to be seen want their faces included and i began to find it more interesting to shoot people in their environment showing some of their environment also the more i shot the more varied uh, locations i would shoot in mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. and it's usually because of poverty this also was not always um uh a, an artistic choice i mean i photographed in um public restrooms and once in an Ivy League library. I've hmm. shot at, you know, in the courtyard of St. John the Divine, uh, at other national monuments we've been run out of, a lot <laughs> on the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. Um and uh one time in the bed of a gay Buddhist monk. Thank you. Oh my thank you, thank you for loaning us that bed. It was, <laughs> it was with his permission. But um, <laughs> You know, I've been, of course, hassled by the police plenty. A lot, a lot of New York police don't know the law. I know the law. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a person who, when I travel, the first thing I do when I'm planning a trip is not, you know, I don't go to TripAdvisor. <laughs> I look up legal texts and try to find the public nudity laws for that mm -hmm. location so I can not get people arrested which is always my a number one goal not to right. get arrested um and in new york we have quite liberal laws you know you mm -hmm. can you can photograph you can be topless any people of any sex any gender can be topless for any reason mm -hmm. and you can be completely nude for the purpose of creating art and that mm -hmm. does not keep the cops from hassling us or breaking up a shoot or following us or threatening us. Um, but, you know, you do what you have to do. But you know your rights, yeah. I think that were you, you were you photographed Melina, when, speaking of Melina again, during her Metropolitan Museum performance piece, right? The um, body painting in front of the Met? Or that the... was on the front steps of the New York Public Library. The oh, New the Public Library, New thank you. Public Library, yes. That was wild. It was, um, and it was an event. I mean, it was intended to be an event and it was quite an event because this is a very busy area. We had three models. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm not good at all at promoting or press or anything like that. I just say, okay, to what comes at me and, you know, try to get myself through it. But this was a lot of effort on the part of other people. So I thought maybe I should put out a press release. Mm. Allison, I put, I sent a press release out to about a half dozen entities the night before, mm -hmm. not, not wise, the night before my sloppily, clumsily thrown together press release. And by morning I had a ton of, people saying okay we're going to be there we're going to have this can we interview you including the ap so the wow. AP came and did a video interview and wrote a written piece which appeared in 
newspapers all over the world. And it was 100% positive and wonderful. Mm. Uh, That's great. So, you know, we were, we got that message out to cultures where they couldn't even include a photo. Mm. Um, Actually, a lot of, a lot of them couldn't include a photo, but it was wonderful. And there was also tremendous outreach because um, the models were busy being painted. The, the body painter was busy painting them. I was, I was the butterfly flitting around until it was time to shoot them. I was Mm -hmm. doing outreach. People had questions. People had wonderful questions. I would, I'd speak to people uh, who'd never heard of fat liberation. Mm. They would accept, they would be lovely and polite, accept my answers. And then they would come back 15, 20 minutes later with more questions and it was it was just great. We had hundreds, I'm at all times about hundreds of people standing around watching us. Mm. And uh, it was just wonderful. And the cops, of course, <laughs> yeah. even though we had taken precautions not to be broken up, not to be arrested, um, the cops came and you know looked at our paperwork and then just sat in their cruiser and watched the rest of the day. Yeesh. Yeah, it was I remember. wonderful. It was wonderful. Wow, wow. I mean, that's uh, that kind of performance art is so it's so edgy for for me to just because like it, it does. It's amazing to, to to see the bravery of people who are willing to get naked in fr- front of large crowds and then basically just say like we know our rights and the cops are going to try and harass us away, but we are going to hold our ground all while you know hundreds of people are milling around taking pictures and it's just, it, it sounds so intense. <laughs> yes. While naked, while naked. We had a couple yeah. that day. We had two women who were both from out of town, not together say, can I, can I join in? Can I take my shirt off and get painted? Oh. And it, we hadn't planned on that, but we said, sure. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> it was. And you know, it was, um, I remember uh, coming to New York as a visitor before I moved here, and you know you would do just very wild things that you wouldn't normally do if you lived here <laughs> or if you were back at home. And I felt great giving them a story to take home and, and some pictures. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, yeah, of course. Like, what a what great quintessential New York story. It's like, yeah, I went to go see the library, the lions in front of the library, and ended up getting naked and painted with a bunch of performance. Right there artists. between patience and fortitude, we were <laughs> there in all our green painted uh, jiggle, and it was wonderful. It was fabulous. Oh, that's so wonderful. It, now, does that does that piece have a name that people could look up or? Um, it is, if you go to adapositivity.com and click, uh, scroll down and click where it says, you know, click here to see the naked people, um, you'll find maybe about a, a dozen or two dozen galleries. And one of the galleries will say, uh, something about the library and you'll see green naked people. (laughs) Yeah, the color green is perfect too because it's very evocative of the of the Statue of Liberty, and it's very it just much has this... that verdigris, uh Yes, look. Yeah, I didn't think of that at the time. We should have done a Statue of Liberty pose. Oh, totally. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought when I saw it. I was like, oh, cool. That's funny. Oh, yeah, body painting in the library. I see it right now. I'm looking at it. Very cool. So, have you ever modeled for your own work? I was the only model at, in the beginning, like the mm. first. Um, this is, ah, uh, uh, okay. I'm just going to say it. Yes, you can see my poon on the internet if you want. Um, <laughs> I would say many of the first images are of me. Uh, and and then I incorporated about a half a dozen um, friends who were willing. But it started, you know, just as a personal, personal little photo blog. I definitely never would have imagined it getting as big uh, in in volume. They're like around 800 photos now. Um, I certainly never expected to have people wanting to join, wanting to participate. But um, I've been fortunate in that I do. But yeah, many of the originals, I don't do it much anymore. 
but um, I, I'm getting ready to do another one uh, unless I unless something happens and I, I don't because I do a lot of don't. But um, I'm on a bit stricter quarantine. When we're taping this, we're in quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's okay to say, but oh, well, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm on a bit, a bit stricter isolation uh, for reasons I won't get into. So mm -hmm. I have not, uh, I have not photographed anyone since mid March, and man, do I miss it. But also there's a, a shoot coming up that needs to happen and it's going to have to be, you know, my ass in this shoot because I can't, I can't be near any other asses. So, you know, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, uh, it's not like I haven't done it before. Yeah. It's such an interesting thing. Like the, I mean, obviously there have been so many consequences and challenges around everyone being socially isolated and, I think one of the things I'm seeing so much of in my communities is, I mean, again, like a lot of people who are like un unwillingly celibate or just missing our friends and community, but a lot of us also are separated from our art pr process right now yes. because we don't have access to models or we don't have other actors to work with or other dancers to move with. And so we're kind of having to reestablish our art practice as a solo practice for the time being. And I'm seeing that being both a kind of exciting challenge for a lot of people and also just this this painful reminder of how important other people are to our sense of artistic selves and it's it's creating a lot of strife in a lot of ways yeah i definitely have never forgotten how important adiposers are to this i mean they're mm -hmm. they're um completely vital it wouldn't ha it wouldn't happen it wouldn't be without them but mm -hmm. uh yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've been kept busy during this time. Um, I also do client photography for money. Add a positivity to pose for add positivity is free to add posers. I've never charged for that, but, but I also take clients and I've been uh, busy doing editing and getting caught up on editing, which I'm always behind on. Um, fortunately, I've been able to keep up with updates because I had a pretty big backlog of adipositivity photos waiting to be. I mean, there have been times where I'll shoot somebody and I say, you might not, you know, this might not post for a year <laughs> because mm -hmm. you have such a backlog. But now we've eaten through a lot of that backlog. And, and yeah. uh, so I'm going to fly without it for a while. But yeah, I've been, I've been busy and I haven't been fretting about aloneness because dear god i love to be alone i love my <laughs> solitude um uh so you know i feel like i've been rehearsing for this solitude all my life but the mm -hmm. things i miss you know i i mean i'm i'm in a much better spot than a lot of people so i i'm aware of that every day so it keeps me from being petty and talking about how much I miss having shrimp okonomiyaki when I want it or how much I, I miss having my neck kissed and hang kissing mm -hmm. other people's necks and, um, and, and just flirting because, you know, I'm not even comfortable chatting people up now because where is it going to go? I mean, I, if I can't see you for now, we're nearing, uh, a kind of an end, but otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, um, it seems kind of pointless, although mm -hmm. I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all very happy that you are. <laughs> I'm flirting and, you know, still chatting people up. I can't help myself. That's good. It's, it's healthy. I remember, um, Carol Queen, uh, I quote Carol Queen in my book, Girl Sex 101, where she says that um, flirting is to relationships as masturbation is to sex. It keeps the juices flowing. It keeps you limber. It keeps you healthy. And even if you can't be in a relationship, flirting is a really healthy thing to do. And I, I love that. It's always helped me remember, especially as someone who tends towards the isolation and the introversion quite myself. It's helpful for me to remember that it's a, it's a muscle. It's good to practice flirting. Um, it's good to feel 
desired and desirable and desirous of people through flirting. So yes, but you know there is a physical element. I'm I I realized the other day when I am ready to go out and can go out. Uh, am I going to be afraid to go out? <laughs> mm, yeah. um, am I going to feel uncomfortable? And I think I might. It's I, And I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's going to be interesting, and I'm very much looking forward to it. And I'm especially looking forward to a time when I can travel again, mm-hmm. uh, because that I really miss. But yeah, I yeah. especially miss the neck kissing. Oh my <laughs> oh my goodness! But you know, it's kind of like boiling something down to the essence. That's what this experience has been like. It makes you realize what is truly important. And apparently, I'm I'm telling your audience that what's truly important to me is Japanese street food and neck kisses. So that's <laughs> you know how deep I am. I I wholeheartedly support that. I think that those are two very important things. So I just have one more question for you. I was thinking as I was kind of scrolling through your site and kind of you were talking about having done this for so long. Do you feel like you've either learned anything about I don't know, fatness itself or or fat positivity or body positivity over the years through your work that you might not have held as a value at the beginning or a thought at the beginning? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that before, and I'm not completely sure I have an answer for you. Um, I mean, I have to say yes, but what I've learned has, I've learned more about the pain that a lot of people experience from being ridiculed for being fat because I never felt that. I'm sure I was ridiculed as much as any other fat person, but either I don't notice it or I don't care about it. Or I also think I have a bit of a, I will kick your ass attitude and look that keeps me safe from, from people who do that largely. Mm. Um, because I, I, you know, I will hear an adiposer will tell me horrible, horrible things that, you know, their family members have said to them. And I'll think, oh, my God, that's that's tr- so tragic. And then I realize, wow, I've heard the exact same things, but it didn't land the same mm-hmm. way. So I have had to learn and it's been beneficial. I've had to learn that stuff from adiposers. I've heard Mm -hmm. their stories, not just adiposers, but a lot of people who write to me, who email me, who contact me or follow me on social media will message me and tell me um, truly sad things that they experience as a fat person that I never have or that I Mm -hmm. haven't felt in the same way. One woman whom I mention a lot because she, uh, she had the biggest, her, this one email just had the biggest influence on me. She said, I've just looked at all of the photos on your site. And today is the first day I haven't cried about my body. And I really took in what it means to cry every day about your body. Um, and not have it relate to shame, but rather have it relate to the way the world sees you and the the grief that the world is going to heap upon you for for the way you look or more specifically because they don't approve of the way you look and that's it Mm -hmm. and much of it is fueled by our tremendous uh, weight loss industry our um, our angst industrial complex that is (laughs) throw has you know billions and billions of dollars every year that uh, uh, devoted to making people feel bad about their bodies and their appearance in general. And we, as fat activists, we don't have that money, but we uh, we have a lot of power, we have a lot of steam, we have a lot of fight in us. And that's what I'm out there doing. And that's what I'm 
trying to do by giving fat people and people with all manner of non-conforming bodies the visibility that all humans need. Here, here. That was beautiful. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, what's the link so for people to look at your work? It's adipositivity.com, A-D-I positivity, all one word, dot com. I can also be found, listen to me promoting myself. I'm so proud of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can also be found on the Soch. On okay. Twitter, I'm at Adipositivity. On Instagram, I'm at Adipositivity. On Facebook, there is an Adipositivity uh, page, which is at Adipositivity. And also uh, me, myself, at Substantia Jones. And I will warn you that um, none of those are safe for work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... But luckily Facebook, none of us are at the office right yeah, now. Yeah, so. Facebook and Instagram <laughs> make me cover up nipples and poon. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, there's lots of pot potty mouth and lots of, um, lots of nudity as with the site at a positivity.com. Cool. And for potential adiposers who want to be photographed by you when it is safe again to do so, how can they reach out to you? Uh, I love email at a positivity at gmail.com. Uh, and, you know, tell me about yourself, tell me where you are, because I often travel or, you know, or did pre-plague, will again, travel mm -hmm. uh, around the world and around the country. And um, I always check out my mail to see who has written me from a particular city when I'm going to visit there. I can't, I just can't seem to travel even for pleasure without doing some adipositivity shooting. I just, <laughs> I've tried. It does not work. I feel I'm, I'm too um, efficient of mind. Like I, I have to cram as much as I can into this trip. So I mm -hmm. always do shooting as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, Substantia, thank you so much for talking to me. It was an absolute pleasure and awesome. good luck thank with you. all of the things. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a pleasure. I always, I always enjoy. I hope I didn't. Nah, I think I behaved myself. <laughs> you were a delight. Oh, thank you. As were you. Thank you so much, Allison. My pleasure. And that is it for this week's episode of the Artgasm Podcast. Thank you, as always, for joining me. If you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more, please consider becoming a subscriber. You can do so on any of your favorite podcast downloading devices, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., etc. And also, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash artgasm. There I record a lot of independent episodes. I record, I add some longer episodes. Uh, for instance, the one that I recorded with Stephen Penta was like twice as long, so I'm putting that up there. And so you get extra bonuses every once in a while, and it just helps so much to keep this podcast going during some rather uncertain times. So thank you for everyone who is already a Patreon supporter, and uh, please consider becoming a patron yourself. Until next time, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.